Around Thanksgiving, Matt Patterson, CEO of Audentes and the chairman of the board of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, announced that he'd entered an agreement to sell his company to fellow ARM board member Claudia Mitchell and her colleagues and stakeholders at Estellas. That conversation began at an ARM meeting in October called the Meeting on the Mesa in Carlsbad. And ironically, it was also the site of an initial conversation Claudia held at her then company, Universal Cells, that resulted in a transaction of that company. I'm Janet Lambert. I'm the CEO of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about why ARM has become the water cooler of the cell and gene and tissue community, and also give you a look at developments in this sector in 2019 and a little bit of a preview into what's coming in 2020 to give you some context for the expectations of further partnerships and transactions of that sort. Following my introductory remarks, we'll have a couple of panel discussions with some of the leading CEOs in the space to give you a feel for innovation in the cell side of the sector as well as advances in gene therapy. So it should be a packed, informative, and interesting two hours, and I'm glad you were able to join us today. So to get started, for those of you who aren't familiar with ARM, ARM is an international advocacy organization focused on bringing safe and effective cell and gene therapies to patients around the world. In our vernacular, regenerative medicine means cell and gene therapy and tissue engineering. We are made up of 350 global member organizations, mostly companies, but also nonprofits, research institutions, patient advocacy groups, and the like. Our priorities really are to drive the development of clear and predictable regulatory pathways for the sector, effective reimbursement policies for the therapies in this sector, to try to help the community overcome manufacturing hurdles and barriers, and to gather and disseminate sector data so as to educate stakeholders, the media, policymakers, and others. Here is a list for those of you at least in rows one, two, and three of the ARM member companies. Um, the point being there's a lot of them, and uh, those in blue are public companies in our community. Um, just a note before I get into the review of the sector developments for 2019, if you're interested in the data that I'm about to present or the charts themselves, they'll be available on the ARM website and they'll also be tweeted out momentarily. So ARM has a data partnership with Informa and as a result we curate uh, a particular database um, with our knowledge of the sector. And currently in that database, we are tracking 987 companies globally active in cell and gene therapy. As you can see, the majority of those are in North America, but there's a significant uh, community in Europe. And notable, uh, not surprising, the fastest growing portion of this community year over year has been in Asia, where the number of companies we're tracking has grown by 28%. Another snapshot of the sector is here. Um, th 2019 has been a very strong year generally, and 17 products have shown sufficient data to win expedited approval, either in the United States, Europe, and or Japan. The pipeline of products in development continues to grow. We've got more than 1,000 clinical trials underway, and the sector took in $9.8 billion in financing in 2019. I'd like to start by saying a few words about patient impact, since that's why we're all here. It's been a year of dramatic impact uh, for patients, thanks to the current therapies in the market. We've seen thousands benefiting from the commercial products in the market, as well as in clinical trials. And we have a robust pipeline bringing an additional complement of products to patients in the near term. Here's a look at some of those. 
Um, you know, what's notable about these therapies, I think, what, what makes us all so excited to be in this sector is that they're not incremental improvements for a few patients, but in fact, dramatic improvements for patients and patients in significant numbers. So here we show the response rates for some of the five most recent market entry. It's also worth noting that of those 1,000 clinical trials I mentioned, if they were all to fully enroll, we'd have 60,000 patients enrolled in regenerative medicine clinical trials. It's estimated that half a million patients will benefit from cell and gene therapies just in the United States over the next 10 years. Coming behind these early products is a rich array of additional products we expect to enter the market in 2020. As you can see, this list spans gene therapy, cell therapy, and tissue engineering. Some are expanding their geographical reach, and others are entering the market for the first time. We anticipate approvals in Japan, Europe, and the United States across a range of indications, including the first approval for heme A and the devastating pediatric disease, EB. The clinical landscape for regenerative medicine is a strong one. Here's the data behind some of those takeaways I mentioned earlier. Oh, sorry, I'm off, I'm off kilter here. Um, I want to talk a minute about the clinical and the scientific landscape for regenerative medicine. Um, there have been substantial late stage developments this year. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. There's been an explosion of gene modified cell therapy trials. There's an increasing num amount of clinical activity across indications and in more prevalent indications. We've seen some terrific advances in gene editing in the clinic, and we've had notable progress in viral and non-viral gene delivery methods. So here's some of the data uh, behind those takeaways. As you can see globally, across cell therapy, gene therapy, and tissue engineering. We have almost 100 programs in phase three. Phase two is extremely robust with 591 programs. And phase one is also healthy with 381 programs. And you can see on this chart how those break down by technology type. One of the things I think is interesting in this data is the growth in gene-modified cell therapy as a share of the phase one trial pipeline. As you can see, it makes up almost 58% of the phase one trials versus less than 20% in phase three and about a third of phase two. Here you can see the indications that are covered by the clinical trials that we're tracking Obviously, the majority of the trials are in oncology, including many rare forms of cancer, but there are also significant numbers of trials in musculoskeletal, CNS, metabolic, and cardiovascular. Many of these are also in indications with larger patient populations. Those trials shown here in purple here we see many of the trials and indications I just mentioned, but also including diabetes. So you see, as noted, 40 ongoing clinical trials in common cardiovascular indications, 23 trials in diabetes and related complications, and so on. It's been a big year in the clinic for somatic cell gene editing. There are 31 ongoing phase one trials around the world. About two thirds of those trials are in the United States, 20% in Europe. You can see here the division across indications. CRISPR joined zinc fingers and talons in the clinic, and we saw the first patients treated for beta thalassemia 
sickle cell. In fact, this is a picture of the first sickle cell patient treated with CRISPR, Victoria Gray. The first patient treated for sarcoma. We saw evidence of successful in vivo editing. We have an announcement about further the first CRISPR in vivo editing expected shortly. And we saw Allergene, Selectus, and Precision enter the clinic with gene-edited allo car -Ts. We saw important advances in gene therapy delivery as researchers drove progress across a number of um, programs. Examples of technologies under development include next generation AAV vectors, improved methods of non-viral delivery, novel delivery devices, and the use of synthetic biology to control cell behavior. A few of these are noted here. Potential benefits of these new technologies include improved transduction and transfection efficiencies, avoiding immunogenicity issues, and more specific targeting for challenging applications like solid tumors. As you can see here, 57, there are 57 ongoing gene therapy trials utilizing non-viral delivery methods. And we've seen some significant corporate partnerships emerge to try to address issues like immunogenicity and manufacturing challenges. As expedited approval pathways have become commonplace, as manufacturing challenges and complexity persist, and as manufacturing capacity is constrained, manufacturing strategy has become a key success factor for companies both large and small in 2019. And not surprisingly, that meant that external manufacturing partners became attractive M&A targets in 2019. So this year we saw Pfizer and Novartis each invest hundreds of millions of dollars in in-house manufacturing capacity in North Carolina and Colorado. Kite announced investments in California and Maryland. I had the pleasure of joining Thermo Fisher CEO Mark Casper, Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker at the ribbon cutting of the Thermo Brammer Viral Vector Facility in Massachusetts. Harvard and a number of other Boston area institutions announced a new center for biological manufacture. And all of these are just illustrative examples of the big investments in this space. The action isn't just limited to big or late stage companies, but rather we also saw pre-market companies make big investments in early manufacturing. These include Audentis, Regenex, Elevate and Precision, as shown here. CMOs were attractive targets in 2019 with Novartis, Hitachi, Thermo, and Catalent all making significant decisions to add more manufacturing capacity to their companies. In financing, we saw total global financings in 2019 reach the second highest level since we've been tracking. It was an extremely strong year for venture financing and corporate partnerships. We saw increased activity on large and mid-cap bio and pharma companies in cell and gene therapy. And interestingly, European companies had a particularly strong year in financing relative to 2018. As I noted earlier, $9.8 billion flowed into the global sector this year with the majority of that focused on gene-based technologies. The total includes multiple financings over $200 million, including transactions involving AskBio, Unicure, CRISPR, and Century. Here's how 2019, excluding M&A, stacked up against recent years. As you can see, 2019 was meaningfully down from 2018, about 25%. But 
but also above the previous watershed year of 2015, making for generally an attractive fundraising climate. Here's a list of the 33 financings that surpassed $100 million in 2019. As you can see, they cover both corporate partnerships, there was a good deal of activity in venture. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And there were a number of public offerings. Among the most notable, Adaptive Biotechnologies, $300 million upfront agreement, the Vertex CRISPR Therapeutics, partnership in Duchenne's, and others here. Taking a look at the financings by category, you can see that the IPO market trailed 2018 significantly, as did follow-ons. And follow-ons, in fact, trailed 2017 and 2018. That said, there were many significant corporate partnerships announced this year, with several focused on larger patient population indications including those involving Mesoblast, Regenex, Beam, and Voyager. It was a very strong year in venture capital. The bright spot, I would say, over 2019, with venture capital in the space up over 32% compared to 2018. Some of the major venture investments included, in addition to those I'd mentioned earlier, Mays, Poseida, Inscripta, and Achilles. On the M&A front, it was an active year. The deal I mentioned earlier, Astellas and Audentes. That deal, having not closed, is not actually contained in this left-hand 2019 bar, but it does include the Roche acquisition of Spark, Vertex, Sema, Biogen, acquisition of Nightstar, and Bears acquiring the remaining stake in Blue Rock. I mentioned that globally, overall, 2018 was down from 2019, but this was not the case in Europe, where financings actually ticked up ever so slightly, 2019 versus 2018, based on some of the key transactions that you see here, Adaptive, Unicure, Orchard, Achilles, and Autolus. As we look forward to 2019, uh, excuse me, as we look forward to 2020, we see the usual combination of sun and clouds. I think we have to point out that one of the key priorities of ARM and the sector is to get the reimbursement environment right. As you can see from this chart, we are moving in a positive direction from a patchwork of products being reimbursed across various countries to a more consistent uh, reimbursement environment of products being covered in multiple countries. You see this particularly in the CAR-Ts, but also for a growing number of gene therapy companies. But there's work to be done. I mean, there is, um, there is appetite and interest on the part of policymakers around the world in new kinds of value-based agreements, including paper performance contracts and payment over time, but they're still one-by-one -one conversations that take a lot of time. We haven't yet evolved to the point where there are standard models that can ease the transition of these products into the market in a fashion that's commercially successful. Now, this is certainly a job for us, a job we began, of course, earlier, but which will continue into 2020. <coughs> More data and analytical work will help payers and developers alike, and for that reason, 
ARM engages in some of that analytical work. And last year, uh, excuse me, last week, we released a new analysis of what 10 years of cell and gene therapy for sickle cell, hemophilia A, and multiple myeloma would mean for total healthcare costs in those indications, finding that even considering a range of potential upfront costs, including significant upfront costs, cell and gene therapies could reduce the cost of these indications, of treating these indications, by between 18 and 30 percent, while obviously significantly improving patient lives. Looking at other aspects of the landscape for 2020, we anticipate numerous data readouts, and I think as the trickle of data readouts becomes more of a flow, of course, there will be a mix of very positive data and disappointing data, which just comes with the maturity of the sector. The number of marketed products will grow significantly, expanding the patient impact of the sector. The demand for financing will continue to be strong, the IPO market hampered by the U.S. election, but in general, it seems that indications for the financing market are positive. We'll continue to see in the science and technology evolution of the space important advances in gene therapy as well as in cell therapy. On the policy side, we have our eye on the hospital exemption and regulatory exemptions generally, and we'll continue to try to limit the expansion of these kind of exemptions to the current safety and efficacy framework used by the FDA and the EMA. Of course, the debate about drug pricing is far from over and will undoubtedly heat up as we head into election season in the United States. But we've seen that even in the context of a drug pricing debate, progress on implementing value-based agreements and new kinds of reimbursement models for gene and cell therapy can also advance. And so we are not pessimistic about our ability to move forward the kind of policy advances that we need in this field. Finally, I'd say we anticipate a continued very positive and encouraging working relationship with the FDA, the EMA, and regulators around the world who've shown us an incredible partnership in bringing these therapies to market. So in summary, 2019 was a year of significant growth in the regenerative medicine sector, and we enter 2020 poised for continued expansion. Many patients are already benefiting from the dramatic clinical power of these therapies, and I think that that impact will only grow as the year goes on. The pipeline is robust with several next generation technologies entering the clinic and an increase in clinical trials for indications with small and large patient populations. Considerable effort and progress is being made to address various manufacturing challenges of this sector. And while financing dipped a bit in 2019 versus 2018, it remains strong across venture and partnerships. And it's clear that there will be a continued strong appetite for M&A coming in the year ahead. So with that, let me thank you um, and uh, let you know that as I mentioned earlier, you're able to get this presentation at the ARM website along with a number of other resources including anticipated data readouts. We keep an active list of what products have received expedited approval designations around the world and the like. So as you work in this sector, um, please take advantage of those resources.